now the floor is open and we can collect uh, uh, questions and also uh, the comments are most welcome as well. Oh yeah, we have uh, one gentleman over there and uh, we may collect uh, some, you know, around five questions and we may invite uh, the uh, speakers to respond. So um, please identify yourself and um, uh, then uh, uh, to be short about your questions. Yes, I'll, please. I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Adam Slosser. I'm from MIT. Uh, thank you all, uh, the three speakers, for your talks. I thought they were very stimulating. And hopefully my question is a synthesis of, of all of your points. And that is um, what struck me with the first talk was the, the statistic that 80% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from cities. Um, and that we do have an opportunity to think about this not just in terms of greenhouse gases but co-benefits. And then the third speaker talked about in particular different forms, if you will, of cities. And my question is this. <laughs> A city in and of itself is going to have millions and millions of people together. There's no way that we can really avoid the fact that they're, they're going to produce greenhouse gases both directly and indirectly. And my question is, is from that 80 percent, how much can you envision that being reduced by all these different forms of cities that you're proposing? And perhaps maybe another way of looking at this is not just the reduction of greenhouse gases but also the co-benefits. How much do we even think is going to reduce just the health effects with the, the new structures of these cities. Thank you. Yes, that's a, a very uh, uh, random, random question. And now uh, we have uh, a, oh, the lady in front. Uh, thank you so much, and all the three presentations were very interesting. Um, I'm Brinda Vishwanathan from Madras School of Economics, Chennai. Uh, my question is directly to Jose. Um, uh, when you're talking about co-benefits uh, in terms of the cities, I think that the issue of poverty doesn't come up uh, quite effectively. And I think the two of the examples that you were talking of, Yogyakarta and Delhi, there are also issues of you know very specific things like solar rickshaws and things like that, which have co-benefits of a very different kind, a sense that you provide employment to the poor and you also think of options that are uh, also uh, sort of more green, but they might be short term, but why aren't these also being considered as part of uh, the development process and here you also have green buildings and things like that which have pro uh, which also address issues of housing, urban housing in the, in the sense of the, for the poor people. So, but I don't see that come through in, in some of your discussions that you're making and, and what could be the reason for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that the you know, poverty has to be. Um, yeah, the gentleman over there. Uh, uh, thank you so much for all your uh, interesting presentations, uh, three of you. Um, I have a specific query to uh, Mr. Joes. Uh, you talked about co-benefits. Uh, that essentially means that you do some activity and try to reap another benefit out of it. Uh, my question is, unless you quantify and make it tangible, the benefit won't remain a benefit for, a, for the city government. For example, you derive GHZ mitigation as co-benefit out of uh, a transportation activity in your city. Unless you get a kind of tangible benefit out of it, the co-benefit would not remain a benefit for the city. They won't get benefited otherwise. Example, uh, so it could be a CDM project coming out of an initiative which is not aimed at greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, that could be a straight uh, uh, and simple answer. But do you find any other tangible co-benefits or the mechanism to uh, convert the co-benefits into tangible uh, entity uh, in any city so far? Thank you. Very good question. Materialized co-benefits is also a challenge. Okay, the lady in front, and then we go to the back. Hi, I'm Rianti from Indonesia. Um, I have, um, I think, a similar, um, a simultaneous question for the first and third speakers. Um, I think my first point to the first speaker is that. Um, I understand the, the World Bank program for mitigation and adaptation, uh, mitigation and adaptation at, at serious level. But sometimes, based on your presentation, um, I just don't see um, 
I mean, like when you when you put the, the program as sustainable cities, but if you look at cities in poor or developing countries, some of the cities are just um, their their emission their emission uh, level is just so low. So why would you spend efforts on uh, measuring them or um, in the first place? And then also it comes um, on the opposite opposite side to the third speaker. I mean, all your examples there were very encouraging, but I didn't see, um, can you please um, elaborate more on how you can see these this innovations or can be applied in uh, poor or developing countries? Because all your examples there were, are like some of, I mean, are done in, in developed countries. So thank you. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. And uh, so, yes, we have uh, the, uh, the lady here. Uh, <coughs> here. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for those stimulating sessions. My comment is on Mr. Wang's paper. Um, the, the urban forms you proposed, the compact city, we've come to see really that it's a theoretical thing, though maybe it could be workable in some sense, but once the city has developed, once it's emerged, there really is no way to make it compact again, except maybe by, 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 by reducing the distances traveled, probably through transport and things like that. But you know, making it compact in the real sense, or physically, may not be workable. But the activities in the city, you know, can be tamed down, or let me say, they can be more efficiently performed, and that is what really can make the city compact. Thank you. Good. We can uh, get uh, one or more two questions. Um, then uh, we uh, uh, ask the uh, uh, speakers to respond. I think this is a, a very good question. You know, for buildings we can retrofit, but for cities we cannot. That easy to get them retrofitted. So yes, please. Hey, thanks very much for your presentation. Yeah, uh, the adaptation and uh, mitigation is, are very important to the city's devel development. But uh, mm, uh, I, I think in, uh, in person, uh, the adaptation may be more important to us to cope with the, adapt uh, uh, cope with the climate change. But uh, uh, the, we know that there are many diff difference, uh, many benefits we come from these measures adapted to cities. But uh, uh, how should we consider the cost of these measures? I think it maybe the cost will be higher than the benefits uh, you mentioned on uh, on the city's development. So, I my question is how should we uh, consider the um, costs? of these adaptations, or well, how should we balance this cost and the benefits of this adaptation? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that, you know, urban resilience is uh, very much a key issue uh, we have to uh, pay attention to. I think that we should stop here for the questions, and we've got six minutes, and each uh, speaker, you are, you are allocated two minutes each to uh, Respond to some, you know, ten questions uh, raised, so I do not have to repeat in the interest of time. So uh, you may, you know, select the uh, questions you want to respond, and of course, you know, the uh, uh, PowerPoint slides will be made available to uh, everybody. And uh, of course, during lunch time, we can have uh, uh, discussions as well. So the floor is yours. I think that you know we may um, um, go. Um, you know, the order in, uh, in reverse. So Mr. Wang, you uh, come first, and then uh, we may ask uh, Marcus, and then you are the last. Um, I will answer, the qu thank you very much. And all the question is very interesting and uh, great for our studies. And uh, uh, I would explain about the, how the, this kind of innovations in, implied in our developing countries, especially for some poor countries. I think it's quite difficult, because urban planning is a compromising environment policy in all, all worldwide. We cannot uh, uh, answer uh, all the package of the quest, uh, problems in, in one time, because if we develop an urban area, 
and all the people will criticize about the, how we developed it, where we got money, and uh, if the urban planning is suitable for this area. So for developing countries, we need to choose a suitable way for us. We should first think of, about how we have, what's the uh, local resource we have, and what's the local conditions, for example, the culture, the history, and natural resource, and then think about development policy. If this is a poor country, like a poor city, there must not so much private cars, and uh, we can benefit from build more neighborhood uh, like the car-free neighborhood. It's not a ex expensive thing, and it's quite practical. Practical, for example. And then I will answer about the question. And uh, um, the different kind of urban forms, um, it's how it can be implied to balancing the different. Uh, um, aspects like you know, economical, social, and uh, the and the environmental protection. I think urban planning and the development policy is uh, complex and uh, uncertain. And we need to when our urban planners do a uh, urban planning work, we need to consider so much, not only the future but also today. And it it is uh, not a one solution. And we need to consider so much from different aspects. I think we need to think out um, how it sustainable form. We need to um, we need to consider first what the society structures of the cities and uh, the economical conditions, and then we should think about a practical solution and uh, environmental quality. It's very important. It should be combined, combined with other two aspects. But um, the other two is to consider first. For example, we have the power to operate this policy, and then we can operate. But not we see, we imply so much innovations like the uh, public transportation. We built a lot of road road in the we want to build in the urban planning but we where we got money so we need to consider our economic conditions and the social conditions first okay. Okay. Thank you. thanks um, I think I'll should maybe speak to the first question um, um, first um, which was I think if I understood it correctly well how much can we really expect to reduce um, in particular through um, actions in cities um, one thing I didn't mention um, earlier in my presentation was uh, if, if you and coming up to that up to 80 percent figure attributable to the residents of cities um, if you look at some of the work for example uh, from Anu Ramaswamy and others um, who tried to put in all of the embodied emissions um, what we've seen is that the per capita emissions of cities um, are actually as high or almost as high as the national emissions once you put all of the embodied emissions. Um, and again, that's not surprising because of all the acti uh, economic activity and consumption which goes on um, in cities. So um, to my mind, um, the, the solutions still need to be concerted, global, and across all of the sectors, energy, agriculture, you know, so, so on and so forth. But um, I think the, the, the point is this, um, and when you look at organizations like ICLE, C40 City, so on and so forth, is um, the, it, it, it's also just part of the motivation for action, with the city saying, you know, we'll take action now, even if, for example, in the international negotiations we're stuck. Uh, we can undertake uh, measures, um, and coming back to the efficiency point, um, and these are things we can do today in our city with the decisions that, that we take. Um, and these are consumption decisions with, um, you know, how we move around our city, um, what kind of energy we consume, so on and so forth. Um, but also, um, and this is coming to the urban form point again, um, and about, you know, the, the, the sort of the long-term lock-in um, about the decisions we're taking. And um, I think it's, you know, the Chinese cities are being built up very, very fast now. Um, but I anticipate if you look sort of 30, 40, 50 years um, in other regions of the world, and these are real decisions, um, large amounts of money um, being invested by governments, by the private sector, um, and these decisions have very, very long-term consequences. Um, the, 
I, I think the point is well taken that you lock in this, that you would will lock in sprawl, but it's a decision about how you want to lock things in. Um, if you are building a, a metro network or you're designing the, the sort of the road system and, and the highway system uh, for and around the city, um, these are decisions you can take about about how you know how you're going to design it. Um, and, 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 and actually, it's a, it's a very large field um, out there which are people talking about these things. Um, a couple more points, actually. Um, I think one of the, a number of questions spoke to um, the sort of the costs um, versus the benefits, and I'm sure Jose, you're gonna speak to the, uh, the co-benefits um, after this. But, but I would say this, um, and, and I, I think I speak here from sort of an operational um, perspective at the World Bank is, you know, every time you make an investment, every time the World Bank, for example, goes out and, and designs and, and takes a decision on an investment project, um, you look at the economic and the financial analysis, sort of the, the cost benefit analysis, and you try and take all of the costs and all of the benefits, including the non-market ones, um, into account. Uh, and this whole discussion then about the co-benefits, what are they, um, becomes really, really important um, because you look at the, when you want to take, when you're taking an investment decisions, you need to look at the alternatives, the alternative um, project designs, the alternative investment de decisions, and also the, uh, the efficiency, you know, how efficient is our expenditure, you know, and how efficient um, um, will this be just vis-a-vis -vis the benefits and the returns um, we're getting. Uh, the last point I'd like to make, and I think this speaks to sort of the urban poverty questions and the adaptation and vulnerability questions, um, um, would be this. And it's actually a message with um, David Dodman and some of his colleagues have been making for a number of years now, uh, is that uh, reducing vulnerability, adapting in cities, especially in low-income cities with respect to the urban poor, is really a question simply of good development in cities. Um, we've been trying to reduce poverty to address all the issues with slums, you know, and so on and so forth um, for many decades now in cities. Um, in some places we made some headway, in other places we haven't. But um, rather than running around and saying, oh, you know, what do we need to do to adapt now in this city? It, 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 I think when it comes down to it, it's all about the good development and continuing to do all of the things we're supposed, we, we've been wanting and and supposed to be doing with um, urban poverty reduction and, 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 and with slums um, in, in the cities of developing countries to do all of that good stuff. Um, and that will actually go a long way to reducing vulnerability and helping cities to adapt. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. So interesting. I'm just going to pick up a few questions that are more related to, to me. Uh, the first question is uh, how to reduce, for example, 80% uh, of the emissions in cities, for example. Uh, I think there is no silver bullet. I can just one thing and you solve all the problems. I think you have to work in different uh, aspects. But there are, as I mentioned, things that if you can do very quickly, if I just give you an example, one case in Sao Paulo, waste management. They reduced 13% in two years, just uh, with a proper landfill burning the methane to generate electricity, and they create a fund, they got a CDM project, they create a fund now that are $50 million that they use for environmental conservation in the city, the environmental fund for the city. It means in two years, you can reduce uh, very quickly, and, and there are some, but all areas much more complex, like urban form. Uh, even in the beginning of the discussion cities, people thought the urban form was very important, but today people think it is not that important. Uh, just to give an example, in the U.S., they think they saw this study, if you double the density, you triple the use of public transportation, you just reduce around 8, 10 percent, and the cost will be much higher. I mean, there are other areas, improve efficiency of the house, that, these things that could give you much more impact with less money. And then uh, I think there is no silver bullet. You have to work in different areas. Uh, regarding the question about uh, uh, poverty, uh, uh, most of the, our case, you, you look at some aspects of poverty, not directly, but there are some implications. For example, green jobs, many, many of the cases you look at are like uh, uh, community-based solid waste management that create some jobs. Uh, 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 but most of the impacts are, are, are indirect, like one case, another case in India, Surat, for example. Just the, you have the plague there in the mid-90s, where a lot of particular poor people dying because of plague in mid, like, uh, mid-90s. Uh, and they could clean up, and there was huge in terms of health effects. And this is where a lot of the indirect impacts are. Uh, for example, when you look at uh, 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 good transportation for the poor, is uh, bring them more access to jobs, you know, the elsewhere, uh, affordable and clean uh, transportation. And in these aspects, in general, those that not much come up in the studies, the World Health Organization 
came up with a study on core benefits in transportation, a very interesting look at the impacts on health. It's, it's much higher than the other impacts, it's just indirect impacts. I also, I, I, I published, uh, I was quoted on an article in, in Lancet like in two years ago on health and climate change, you look at impacts in cities, and you look at most of the, actually the benefits come from, from health, indirect impacts, for, particularly for, for the poor. Uh, and the tangibility, I think there are issues in terms of tangible benefits and economic benefits, most of them are, is a win-win situation, but I think the big, biggest problem is the political economy. You know, these benefits not going to the same people is distributed. In the average, the economies, they all aggregate. In the aggregate, there are uh, positive, the benefits higher than costs, but when you distribute and then some like oil companies and others have a lot of power, they learn to lose and the poor are going to gain, and it means never happened, uh, some of those actions because of the political economy. And look at more, uh, and why they have done very interesting studies on, on the political economy uh, on this aspect, if you, you could look at that. And finally, the adaptation, I agree with Marcus. I just, I have a friend now who works for the government of Rio, and they did these studies on adaptation. And then she came up the the policy. They do all the simulations and don't throw garbage in the river. Don't build in the steep terrain because it's flood. Like just good development. And I think the best adaptation is mitigation because more you take time to mitigate, more expensive, and more adaptation you need in the future. And then I think you have have to focus. It is. I, I, very, I, I think that you have to focus much more on mitigation. The beginning was that when the, now the agenda going a lot to adaptation, but I think mitigation is 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 key for for not making the adaptation worse. Because if you don't mitigate, you have to always uh, run behind the, the adaptation. The cost will be much higher. And I think the adaptation is a good development. It just. Uh, uh, put this on the agenda. I think climate change could bring this idea to align better, because it's just more, one more issue they bring, but uh, it's just good development. Anyway, there are a lot of uh, opportunities, and but how to do, I think this is the big question. You also know the science, you know uh, the costs sometimes, most of the times. Uh, the question is how to create institutions actually to deliver this, and this I think what, what need to do uh, is to, to build institutions, and that's it. Well, I believe that uh, the uh, uh, speakers uh, have uh, answered all the questions. And uh, yeah, of course, I think that, uh, you know, the 80% uh, emissions, uh, how much we can reduce? Uh, we can make some very simple calculations in a matured, uh, developed, uh, you know, urban or metropolitan area. Some, you know, 40% is uh, from uh, the building sector. And we have now you know, passive housing, we have uh, uh, energy efficient uh, buildings, and if we use uh, solar water uh, heating devices, if we use uh, uh, solar uh, <coughs> PV uh, for electricity generation, if we use uh, geothermal, and then half of the emissions could be reduced uh, at least. And then if we look at uh, the transport sector, which accounts something 30% of the total you know, energy emissions, and uh, if we have uh, you know, this sort of you know, compact cities, if we have uh, this you know, public transport like a TOD, transport-oriented development, and then probably half of the emissions can be reduced as well. And then if we go to the industrial sector, and uh, energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy resources would really contribute to a uh, enormous amount of uh, opportunities. So if that's the case, probably more than half of the emissions can be reduced with a lot of co-benefits. Um, well, it's um, very encouraging, and we do have the challenges, we have the opportunities, and also we have the solutions. And um, now we need to uh, finish our session, and uh, I would uh, like to invite uh, the audience uh, to join me to thank the uh, speakers for their excellent presentations. Thank you.